Hi students, I hope that you are doing fantastic. Welcome to another notes lesson. Today we are talking about the southern colonies. Now, when I last talked to you, we discussed Jamestown. So Jamestown is a colony in the southern colonies. Uh, the reason we talk about Jamestown specifically and we're not why we're not going to talk about all these other different like small little colonial towns is because Jamestown was the first permanent settlement. Okay, I can't repeat that enough. Jamestown, first permanent settlement by British, by the British in the New World. Okay, um, so today we're talking about southern colonies. We're also going to eventually talk about New England and middle colonies. Um, similar to your map. Uh, the reason I, I'm going to go on to the next slide and I'll keep talking because you probably want to start writing. <laughs> um, and the next slide kind of just reviews Jamestown a bit. So I'll keep talking, you write, and we'll just do this together because it's all about teamwork. So Southern colonies. Um, the reason we talk about the 13 colonies, first of all, is because these colonies are going to form the United States of America, right? These 13 are the original colonies that will become states and then eventually join together and become the United States of America. So these colonies are the foundation of our country. That is why we study them. It's so important because this is where we started from. This is where our country started from. That's why we study it and we try to understand it. And understanding like the development of these colonies is so important like if you go back and trace things from the colonies to like how it affects society today it will but it will help you better understand society today um so maybe you'll see that a little bit in the southern colonies today when we talk about slavery and we talk about um, that institution and how that still affects america today um anyways i hope you enjoy it i hope you get something out of it um, and uh, just sit back, relax, take a few notes, and I will be your guide. So we are traveling through the South today. I wish I could do a cool Southern accent for you in this video, but I have not perfected my Southern accent, so you'll just have to have regular Miss Collins. Okay, uh, Southern colonies. So we already know we got the Virginia Company. They're going to send out, there's two parts of it, the Plymouth Company and the London Company, um, and they're going to establish two like big settlements in the New World. Why do you come to America? Looking for gold, of course. Uh, also, remember, they're originally looking for a passage to Asia, those first European explorers, and um, it says converting Indians to Christianity, not just Indians, it was really converting anybody they could get a hold of. Uh, so, 1607... London Company settles Jamestown. They're like, hey, it's perfect, it's so safe, but it's ridden with disease because it's also a swamp. <laughs> Hilarious, Jamestown. Ugh, these early settlers sometimes just crack me up. But you know what? Hey, maybe in the time, like, we were like, hey, maybe I would have been one of the people that was like, yeah, this is the perfect place. We love mosquitoes. I don't know. <laughs> I like to think I would have been smarter, but... Who knows? So, Jamestown Colony, uh, remember that there was really poor leadership. Eventually, John Smith shows up and is like, hey, if you're not going to work, you're not going to eat. Uh, and then we also have got that other guy, John Rolfe. I know. Why do they both have to be named John? It was a popular name. What can I say? John Rolfe, he's the one who's going to bring tobacco seeds from, like, the Caribbean that are going to grow really successfully in Virginia. And um, there's this little chart here that's showing the amount of tobacco <laughs> tobacco <laughs> being produced. See that? I was combining produced and tobacco together. Prodaco. Okay, the amount of tobacco being produced over the years. And see how quickly it grows, right? From 1616 to 1627, so a little over 10 years. That's a crazy amount right there. Um, so obviously tobacco really kicks off. And um, it says profits offset the fruitless search for gold. So now people are like, okay, gold, let's forget about it. Tobacco is gold. Um, and one of the problems you're going to see now, I mean, problem for Native Americans, problems for, it's going to create problems for the settlers, is that settlers are going to start to go um, west more because 
all the good land near the shore is getting taken up. So like, hey, let's keep expanding west. But remember, they are not alone. There are other people there, and it's going to just cause a lot of problems. So we'll get to that in a future, in a, in a little bit, in a couple slides. Okay, so we talked, that was a little bit about Jamestown, which remember that it's part of Virginia. Um, let's talk about Maryland. Oh, Maryland, sorry. <laughs> Maryland is going to be started by this guy named Lord Baltimore, and he was an English noble. So remember, nobles, they were like the wealthy, rich people. And uh, he's got a pretty awesome life in England. And then he's like, hey guys, guess what? I'm Catholic now. And that's a problem because remember our good friend King Henry VIII who had his six wives? And I remember he had a little problem with the Catholic Church because they want to give him a divorce. And they're like, hey, sorry, Henry. And so then he starts his own church, right? The Anglican Church. So meanwhile, you got Lord Baltimore who's like, hey, I still think it's cool to be Catholic. <laughs> and um, most people are, like, not thinking it's so cool to be Catholic anymore after it's officially not the official religion of England. So anyways, he is Catholic, and he's just having some troubles in England. So and he's like, I want to make a colony in the New World for Catholics where um, we can have religious freedom. Um, so that's where Baltimore, his son ends up taking over after he dies and um, establishes this colony. And a lot of settlers come, yes, for the religious freedom, but also because Maryland has a lot of natural resources and really good farmland. So it's just got a lot to offer. Um, and they're not just welcoming Catholics. They're very tolerant. They accept Protestants as well. Um, and they're going to create this act of toleration, which basically says, hey, you are welcome to come here and practice your religion freely. Isn't it interesting like how much that was like a value. You're going to hear this continually when we talk about the different colonies, like people coming to the colonies for religious freedom. Um, and that was a huge deal in the founding of our country and the founding of our nation. And it's still a huge deal in America too, to this day. There's lots of, there are a lot of countries around the world where you are not allowed to practice any religion you want. Like you have to practice whatever the country tells you to practice. So um, it's still a very unique idea, and um, you'll see that more in the development of our government. Okay, let's talk about Sweet Caroline, do, 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 or Province of Carolina. I'm just trying to keep you guys entertained here, <laughs> keeping you awake, make sure you're listening and not turning down your volume and saying Miss Collins is the worst. Okay, the Carolinas, it's basically a two-for-one deal. Um, because it's going to start as one colony and then it's eventually going to be split into two, not until 1729. So way down the road. Um, but originally it's chartered in 1663, um, has a representative assembly, assembly similar to Maryland's, um, a lot of Protestants, um, you got some French and, um, some of the West Indian planters who brought slavery to the region also come there. Uh, and the economy is based on cash crops. So remember cash crops? So if you're a farmer, you're like, okay, I'm going to grow some corn and stuff. That's like for my family to eat. And then I'm going to grow some tobacco and I'm just going to grow that to sell. So that's like a cash crop. It's not really being used for like food or a substance for you and your family. It's just to make money. Um, other things to talk about with the Carolinas, you're going to see North Carolina is a lot more smaller farms and... Um, a lot of people are going to come from Virginia to North Carolina and put tobacco there and grow tobacco. And South Carolina has much larger plantations, like huge plantations. It's very similar to like the Caribbean and um, just very nice. If you've ever been to South Carolina, I haven't, but it looks very beautiful. I would love to go. Okay, cool. So let's keep going. <laughs> let's talk about our, our poor friend Georgia, who you might have kind of gets a little bad reputation. <laughs> so Georgia is going to get granted a charter in 1732. And um, if you guys can say this guy's name, I would love to hear it. Founded by General James Oglethorpe. What a great name, right? Oglethorpe. What if they had named the colony after him? What if that instead of it was Georgia, it was Oglethorpe? Well, luckily, it's not uh, called Oglethorpe. 
It's called Georgia. And Georgia, like I said, it kind of gets a bad rep. Um, so here's what you have to understand. Uh, back in England, they had this law. It was called the English Debt Law, where if you owed someone money, you could be put in jail until that money was repaid. So did you catch what I said? English debt law, if you owe money, so like, hey, I owe um, Mr. Beck $20 and I haven't paid him, he could put me in jail. How am I going to pay him this $20 back? Like, luckily, $20 is not that big of a deal today. But I'm just saying, like, I'm in jail. How do I make that money? There's nothing I can do. So you see how this, like, cycle, you're just going to sit in jail. So obviously it's not okay. So this guy Oglethorpe was like, hey, let's try and make a colony where people can go and work off their debt. Um, and so you come, you work in Georgia, and that's going to pay off your debt back in England. And the other great thing about Georgia is that it kind of is going to be a buffer from Florida or Florida. Um, the reason we want to be safe from Florida is because the Spanish... Um, have a colony there in Florida or Florida. Um, and that's a little too close for comfort to our British colony. So Georgia is like a little buffer zone and says, hey, at least like they'll just get the convicts and like the criminals in Georgia before they get to anybody else. So that's good old Georgia. It doesn't have just the greatest reputation. Okay, let's talk about some general ideas of what life was like in the southern colonies. Oops, sorry. Uh, so we've got outbreaks of malaria and yellow fever, which keeps life expectancies low um, because you got a lot of like swampy weather around there. Mosquitoes are really prevalent. And remember what I said about mosquitoes? They just, they're like the deadliest animal ever <laughs> or insect ever. There you go. Um, just spreading diseases like crazy. Um, it's also difficult to start families and create solid settlements in the South. Um, and the climate and soil create a tobacco economy. So based off of the region in the South, that's what's going to affect like what they do in the South, if that makes sense. That sounded really simple, but I didn't want it to be simple. Like based off of like the weather, based off of the people coming to the Southern colonies, that's going to affect like what is successful there and that's going to be tobacco and that's going to be other crops and that's why the the south is going to just be really developed as like agricultural which is really key to understand because when we learn about like civil war and big differences between the north and south it all goes back to settlements in the 13 colonies Okay, so um, something else about the 13 colonies would be this head right system. Sorry if this is a little difficult to read, but basically it was to encourage the importation of workers. Um, and what would happen is you would get 50 acres of land um, given to the head of a family. Um, and you could even receive up to a thousand acres just if you came and worked in the colonies. Um, so that was the incentive. Come and work and you will get land. And remember, England is only an island, so there's only so much land there. Um, America's kind of like endless and abundant at this point. Um, so land is valuable. Okay, <sighs> let's talk about our good friend, bacon. Yeah, bacon. We're going to talk about bacon today, not the bacon that you have for breakfast or on your sandwich or covered in chocolate. <laughs> We're talking about a guy named Nathaniel Bacon. Um, and this is really important to understand Bacon's Rebellion because you guys are going to be doing a little newspaper project about him, um, about the rebellion, in fact. So make sure you're paying attention to this because you want to understand it. So when it comes to do your newspaper, it's super simple for you. Okay, so Bacon's Rebellion. Um, we're basically jumping back to Jamestown, so don't get confused. Jumping back to Virginia, back to Jamestown. And here's what you've got. You've got this guy named Governor Sir William Berkeley. And all the governors at this point are appointed by the king in England because these are British colonies. Um, Berkeley is the king's favorite. He's pretty well respected. Um, he's also, though, a little bit sneaky. Um, he... 
makes a lot of money from the fur trade with the Native Americans. So his goal is to keep a friendly relation with the Native Americans. So you might want to add that on there. I know it's not, it might be on the next slide. Let's see. Yeah, we have to go through a lot on here. And then I'm really talking about the next one. So you might want to add that on there just so it might help you with your paper, um, your newspaper that's um, he, his goal is to keep friendly relations with the Native Americans because he makes a lot of money trading furs with them. Okay. Um, which is going to, you'll see is going to cause a problem. And then you've got this guy, Nathaniel Bacon Jr. Um, and he also lives in Jamestown. He's more of a troublemaker and he's going to be sent to Virginia by his dad. And he's like, ah, this kid's driving me crazy. I'm going to send him to Virginia and hope he grows into be a man. Um, <laughs> we'll see. We'll, let, let's see if that happens. And he is very well-spoken. Originally, him and Berkeley are, like, kind of buddies. Like, they get along pretty well. Um, and But Bacon is just, like, a well-spoken leader. What a surprise. His name is Bacon. What do you expect from that? Okay. So, what? Ha why? The, what's going to happen with these two people? Um, you're going to have this big conflict, which I kind of talked about before, where you've got more and more people coming to work in the colonies. Um, a lot are coming over, like, just to get lands, um, for different opportunities, for religious freedom. But you're going to get a lot of new people coming to the colonies, and they want land. And as I said before, all that good land that's on the coast like close to the water, close to like trading and stuff, that land is getting taken up by like the wealthy and like higher ranking people. And so said like the newer settlers have to start moving more west and getting more land there. Um, and like I said, it's not like this land is just empty. Um, there's Native Americans that live here. And so you're seeing like a lot of Indian attacks, a lot of fights in the frontier. And obviously no one is innocent in this. It's not like the Indians are just attacking people. Like the settlers were not respectful either and not very good and did not always treat the Native Americans in a good way at all. Um, so basically, that's the conflict going on. Bacon is one of those guys who's like, hey, I want better land. I don't want to keep fighting with the Native Americans. People are dying and Governor Berkeley is doing nothing about it. Colonists are dying from Native American tax, and Governor Berkeley is doing nothing about it. So Nathaniel Bacon basically gathers all of his homies, um, his other like former indentured servants, other like farmers that are out on like the more western, like poorer farmers, and they basically like lead a huge protest into the into the town of Jamestown, and they make like demands, and eventually they're going to burn down Jamestown. I know. Crazy. Can you imagine, like, if someone did that today, they, like, marked it, marched into, like, San Diego, and they're like, ah, oh, this is what we want, and then they just burn it down? Um, obviously, the city was not as big as San Diego, but just think about that. <laughs> so, they burn down the city, um, and it's just, like, this huge conflict that happens between, again, Bacon, Berkeley, and it's going over this, like, bigger idea, though, of how are we going to deal with like expansion, um, because no one is like protecting these colonists. And we're just, Governor Berkeley is like, hey, I want to keep a good relationship with them because I want their fur trade. But we have colonists, like innocent colonists that are dying as well. Um, Governor Berkeley ultimately crushes the rebellion. And um, Bacon also ends up dying very tragically, like very recently after this from disease. And so that's like the main thing that ends the rebellion. But regardless, it, it did bring up this point because um, what are we going to do with this new land in the West? How are we going to handle the Native Americans? And this bottom point here says landowners begin to distrust indentured servants and import more slave labor. So indentured servants are technically like they're free men. They're still like bonded to you to a certain amount of time to work, but after that, they're free men. A slave is an item, like a piece of property that you own. So you could like have that slave forever and use it forever. Um, not that this is okay in any way. It's just breaking down this idea of why like people are going to want to use slavery more. Okay. Um, so the last couple of things we're talking about really quick, uh, slave trade. We've talked about this before. 
actually this map should look very familiar to you because you're going to see an increased number of slaves coming to the colonies. Um, so the Royal African Company lost its charter in 1698. Um, and because of that, a bunch of colonists are going to rush in and try and make a profit on the slave trade. Um, by the 1660s, you're going to see slave codes, which are drawn up by the colonial governments to um, delineate between servants and slaves' rights. Um, so that's kind of going over again what I was saying with like indentured servants versus slaves. Like indentured servants were still seen as like British, like free men and slaves are not. They're seen as like a piece of property, which is completely ridiculous. But um, so with slavery coming into the colonies and um, the reason we're talking about this with the southern colonies, I know we talked a little bit about slavery and we'll talk about it more this semester as well, but Slavery is going to, like, rule in the South, and it's going to become super prominent. Um, about 10 million Africans were forced over the, over the course of three centuries, so about 300 years, to come to the Americas. Um, the first Africans came to Jamestown in 1619. Slaves were um, too expensive for a poor colonist, um, but then it says by the 1680s, rising wages in England shrank the pool of servants coming over. So rising, wa rage, ugh, rising wages in England means less servants coming, like less indentured servants coming over and more need for slavery. Um, and yeah, that's just sort of like, just want to give a brief introduction to slavery and it coming into the southern colonies and we'll get more into that when we have time to get more into it but that is it for today's lesson i hope you enjoyed it next time i see you we'll be talking about another group of colonies either new england or the middle colonies so have a wonderful day and make sure you put your notes in your notebook and 